You know, living in California, we don't really like dealing with insurance anymore. Like we've got wildfires, we've got crazy snowstorms now, now we've got flooding. And when they come knocking on my door and they try to sell me earthquake insurance, I'm like, bro, you're going to cancel my policy the moment anything happens anyway. So why would I even, the point in me saying this and how it has to relate with brain foods and foods that are good for the brain and longevity is that's like me trying to sell you insurance right now. If I tell you, hey, eat this food, it's gonna be good for the longevity of your brain 30 years from now, do you really care? There's gonna be a small amount of people that actually care until the crap hits the fan and you're like, oh my gosh, I should have listened and I gotta take care of my brain. So I've got nine foods that add to brain longevity, not just brain foods, but foods that impact how our brain is 20 or 30 years from now. So I'll jump right in. The first one is one you've probably heard of before, and that's salmon. Now I'm not just pulling this out of my ear, right? There is a study published in Aging Neuroscience that looked directly at fish consumption and it found that the more that people typically ate fish, the more gray matter volume that they had. Now, gray matter volume is going to basically mean they have more actual brain size and more brain cells. So that's their quote unquote structure. But they also found that it improved mild cognitive impairment, so it improved function as well. Now this is pretty simple. I started with an easy one, and there's no particular order with these. It's probably simply the omega-3s, and also a little bit of the astaxanthin. Okay, that's going to be the sort of antioxidant that's in the salmon. Now with this, that's going to help the cell formation and the actual function. So it increases the membrane fluidity so the brain cells can communicate better, and consequently they can probably grow a little bit better as well. But let's move into the next one. This one is blueberries. And the thing that's interesting about blueberries is up until recently, we didn't realize that the anthocyanins, the antioxidants that were in blueberries, had such a profound long-term effect. You see, there was a study published in Molecules, and this study demonstrated that anthocyanins, which basically is the pigment that's in a blueberry, actually accumulate inside the brain. They don't just cross the blood-brain barrier and directly impact the brain in the short term. They build up in the brain and then offer neuroprotective effects. So it's almost like the more blueberries you eat throughout your life, you might have more of a neuroprotective effect. That's tremendous. But then we look at a study published in Gerontology that looks at all kinds of different things. It looked at 11 different studies and it was looking at all age groups, okay, all age ranges. And they found that ranging from kids all the way up to older people, that there were different sets of benefits with blueberries. In younger people, the blueberries would offer effects on uh, executive function, on short-term memory. And then when you started looking at the older population, there were improvements in mild cognitive impairment, but there were also improvements in psychomotor function. So being able to actually help the brain communicate with the body for overall motor function. This is tremendous, right? Again, it's all because of the neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory effects. This next one is a little wacky and it comes with a disclaimer, so pay close attention. We're talking red grapes. Now, if you go to the grocery store right now and you grab some red grapes, there's a 99% chance that the first ones you're gonna see are gonna be the ones that are the size of a chihuahua and they are just, they're basically not even grapes. They've been so modified to be ridiculously sweet that I think you were being probably doing yourself a disservice because the amount of sugar is going to offset the benefit here. We're talking about the polyphenols that are in red grapes. So if you go for these, you gotta go for the organic ones and best yet, you gotta go for like straight off the vine, like the small ones that are actually not even all that sweet. You can find them, trust me, they're out there. There's a study published in the New York Academy of Sciences. It's a rodent model study, but it was interesting. They found that the red grape polyphenols actually had a huge impact on reducing depressive symptoms, but increasing what's called BDNF, brain-derived nootropic factor, which grows brain cells, and increase in nerve growth factor. So upon two different ways, improving the amount of brain cells and the density and the potency of these brain cells, the strength of these. But then there was also a study published in Molecules that found that these same polyphenols reduced alpha-synuclein formation, which is a huge part of the development of Parkinson's disease. So as far as brain longevity is concerned, as far as nerve health and just neuron health, red grapes could be very potent. Now I'll add as a second to that, pomegranates would tie in with this as well, okay? Pomegranates have very similar polyphenols and you might be able to get it a little bit better without as much sugar by having some pomegranate. Now, the thing we have to look at that's in addition to this is pomegranates also have something called urolithin A. Well, actually they have another compound, but our body converts it into what is called urolithin A. 
Urolithin A is a postbiotic. About 40% of the population can take this compound out of a pomegranate and turn it into a usable compound by the body. So not everyone gets the benefit, but what this urolithin A does is it changes or improves what's called mitophagy. So it takes the my mitochondria, which produce energy in our body and our brain, and it encourages them to go through mitophagy where they essentially recycle unused components of the mitochondria. That can make not only your muscle cells better, your overall just energy factories in the body better, but potentially in the brain as well. So it's like autophagy, which we talk about with fasting, cellular recycling, but happens at the mitochondrial level. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, there's a company called Timeline and Mitopure that has a patented technology. It's been published in JAMA uh, to induce mitophagy. Definitely recommend you check them out and learn a little bit more, but I popped a link down below. It's a product called uh, Mitopure by Timeline. There's a 10% off discount link code there, Thomas10 at timelinenutrition.com slash Thomas. And again, like has nothing to do with being contrived with this video. It's a, it's a thoughtful mention of something that makes sense. They've been a sponsor on this channel before. So I do recommend you check them out. At the very least, just like read up on it and see if it's something that is appealing to you. So that link is down below, top line of the description underneath this video. The next one is turmeric. Now, what's interesting about turmeric is curcumin can cross through the blood-brain barrier, which means that it definitely do something in the brain, but what are we seeing in the research? There was a study published in Nutrition Research that took a look at four randomized controlled trials and they were ranging from like eight to 12 weeks. They found that in that short of an amount of time, there were increases in brain-derived nootropic factor. Now, they saw this pretty quickly in some studies where it was actually improving how quickly could grow brain cells, essentially. But what we've discovered recently is that BDNF doesn't just help grow new cells. It has a protective effect on the cells that are already existing. So we're getting a dual benefit, potentially better short-term improvement, but also protection over the longer term. Then we have eggs. Now, eggs is not that fun to talk about these days. That kind of went out of style about a year ago. And then the media came out and said that the choline in eggs is actually bad for us, when in reality, if you look around and you look at a lot of people, they're probably not getting enough choline. So eggs, yes, they're high in choline. One egg has 112 milligrams of choline. On average, we need about 500 per day. So we're nowhere near the upper intake, let alone the tolerable upper intake. Anyhow, they are a precursor to acetylcholine. So choline is a precursor to acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter that's very important for mood, for memory, for executive function, for overall brain function. In fact, there was a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that took a look at over 1,300 people with dementia. And it found that those that had the worst symptoms with dementia had the lowest choline intake, and those that had the best memory and the best cognitive still, despite having dementia, had the highest amount of choline in their diet. So there's something going on there. Now we move into a really good one, dark chocolate. Chocolate is awesome, okay? There was a study published in Appetite, took a look at 968 people, found basically the more chocolate that people consumed, the better their cognitive function. It's that simple. And they did this with a bunch of different tests. They did it with abstract reasoning, with visual spatial awareness, all this, and all markers were improved in those that had more dark chocolate. Has to do with the flavanols, and mainly what we're seeing in the research is a reduction of neuroinflammation. So dark chocolate does something as far as reducing inflammation in the brain to make the brain function better. This next one is a little bit of a wacky one because we're talking about the gut. We're talking about bone broth, and what's interesting about bone broth is because of the collagen, proline and glycine specifically, those aminos, it helps to quote unquote seal the gut. Okay, these help form junctions in our gut. And when these junctions are formed and they're tight, we do not have inflammatory compounds leaking out of the gut. When we do have these gaps, these compounds leak out of the gut and cause inflammation, but this inflammation can travel to the brain. And this neuroinflammation is a very big problem. We do not wanna be dealing with that. So collagen has the ability to come out and make these junctions a little tighter, reducing that potential downstream inflammatory effect. Next up, when it comes to the nuts, you wanna go for the nuts that look like a brain. It's an easy thing to remember, right? A walnut. Okay, now there's a lot of different reasons why we could think nuts are good for the brain, but let's turn to one particular study. This study was published in the Journal of Nutrition, Health, and Aging. It took a look at over 15,000 people over the age of 70. Okay, so it was a big study. And they found that over the long term, those that had the highest nut intake, pretty much over their lifetime or just longer term, 
had the best cognitive function. And out of this, those that had walnuts had the best of the best. And we're only talking five servings per week. We're not talking a ridiculous amount. We're talking single serving, not even once per day. And it puts them into the highest tertile of overall cognitive function. It's speculated that it's the ALA, the alpha linoleic acid, which is a form of omega-3. But candidly, although walnuts are like the highest omega-3 nut, the amount of ALA you get out of a walnut is just not that astronomical. So I'm inclined to think that it could be something else that we're not thinking of. But next in line, I would probably say macadamia nuts. So if you're looking at nuts, I'd say walnuts. I'd say macadamia nuts because they're anti-inflammatory components. And then there's sort of an obscure nut out there called a peely nut, which seems to be a pretty powerful nut as well. So it's a little bit higher in saturated fat, but a delicious, super low carb nut. So those three, walnuts, macadamias, and peelies. And last but not least, in a very interesting way, extra virgin olive oil, one to two tablespoons per day. There's some really interesting research we're now seeing that olive oil increases the level of brain glutathione. So glutathione is produced by the liver as our own endogenous antioxidant. So it circulates through our body, neutralizes free radicals, similarly to how we would take an antioxidant in like supplement form, except it's produced by our body and it's very, very, very powerful. But when we see it happening somewhat sequestered in the brain, it's a very interesting thing. We don't entirely know what's going on, but we do know that brain oxidative stress and oxidative damage is linked with brain aging. So if we have heightened levels of glutathione in the brain, we can neutralize that and preserve some of the DNA in our brain and prevent it from getting damaged. And it's not seeming to take much. All we were looking at is like one to two tablespoons of olive oil per day to have this protective effect. So these are the best longevity foods for the brain. See you tomorrow.